Welcome to worship. We are so grateful you are here today. I think it was Winnie the Pooh that said to Christopher Robin, it's a blustery day in the 100 Acre Wood. And the same could be said for the Bay Area this last week. We hope you are safe. As you can see behind me are our beautiful bouquet of flowers that came from a memorial service we had for Carol Chin, who was a longtime member of this church. Blessed are those who die in the Lord, says the Spirit, for they will rest from their labors and their deeds will be remembered. We continue today with the sword, the helmet, and the dress. We talk about one of my favorite characters in the Bible, Ruth. But let's begin this service. This is the day the Lord has made. Let's rejoice and be glad in it. Wow, all of those faithful women. You know what they had? They had resilience. You know where that came from? That came from their relationship with God because God is so resilient. Let us pray to our resilient God. Gracious God, you are always at work, renewing and recreating. You are resilient. Nothing gets you down. No matter how much we frustrate you or your plans, you continue to love and forgive us. Your love never fails, never gives up, never runs out on us. Unlike you, we can at times feel defeated. We close windows against the fresh air of new ideas against the sounds of other people's creative thinking, against the winds of change. We often draw the curtains, shutting out the concerns and thoughts of others, shutting out the possibility of exploring a better way. Forgive us for becoming insulated in the comfort of yesterday, activating the protective shields of our hearts today and closing our minds to the newness of tomorrow. Open up our lives and let your spirit blow through. In the merciful name of Jesus the Christ, we pray. 
Amen. Hear the good news of the gospel. Jesus Christ calls us to a new life again and again and again and gives to us a clean slate so that we may be made fresh and new again. Believe the good news of the gospel. You are forgiven. Let us thank God for that forgiveness by singing the Gloria Patri. Having received the grace of God, the peace of Christ is yours. Out in our world, amongst your friends and acquaintances, the peace of Christ may be something that they need right now. So take out your phone, text them, email them, or that person sitting next to you, Give them the holy kiss. The peace of Christ be with you and with all of those who you love. Amen. Welcome, welcome, our classic, our modern. We say hi to our friends in Truesdale, Sterling Court. We also say a special hello to our member friends in Florida. We hope it has been sunnier in Florida this last week than it is here in rainy California. But we welcome you wherever you're coming from. Couple of quick little notes before we begin our message today. So the inauguration of our president was just one week ago, which in COVID years is like a hundred years ago. But just to say that you may have been following some of the Bernie Sanders memes going around with Bernie Sanders in those mittens and his army cargo jacket. Here's one you may not have seen. It is Bernie Sanders with his arms folded, looking totally uninterested, and the subtitle, Presbyterians at a Pentecostal church service. I think I've been that Presbyterian before at a Pentecostal worship service. Anyway, we hope you're doing well. The other thing is to say I have had so much fun and also so much meaning this last week in meeting with several groups of parents in our Next Gen program. And it's just been wonderful to hear your heart and frankly to feel your pain and to hear your lives and to hear about your kids' lives. And we just want you to know that we have some great in-person events taking place in the near future for our kids and also that I just speak on behalf of the entire session, the entire staff, and just say that Next Gen really is our biggest priority in this church moving forward. And so we believe in ministering to all generations, the greatest and the next, but at this juncture, Next Gen is so important. And so you have my personal commitment that we're moving forward to take care of our kids. Okay. So today is our third week of our series called The Sword, the Helmet, and the Dress. And these are metaphors we are using for learning how to be more resilient people, how to be more resilient. And so we've talked about how the sword are our actions, the things we do, the things we think about, the things we assert. Those are our swords. The next part of this is the helmet, and those are our protections. Anytime you find a totally resilient person, it is not just them who are resilient on their own. It is the people and the God in their life that is protecting them. And then finally, we've said that resilient people have a sense of beauty. They have a sense of the aesthetic. They appreciate the things that God brings into their life every day. 
So three weeks ago, we began with Joseph, and Joseph, of course, had a helmet of protection. He had his oldest brother, his dad. He had a, a prison guard. He had a government official. All of Joseph's life, he had these helmets. And then last week, we took a look at the figure of Moses, and we saw that Moses' biggest piece of resiliency was his staff, or mata, as we said, his walking stick. And so all of us need a staff, a thing that we can lean on as we walk forward in this life. So today I'm so excited because I get to share with you one of my favorite Old Testament figures. And her name is Ruth. And Ruth, you may know from images, is a beautiful figure. Here is a picture of her gleaning from the fields. And so she was a completely resilient person but I want to focus on Ruth's actions today. Ruth was resilient because of how she lived her life. And there are great lessons that we can learn about how we can become more resilient in our own lives from learning from Ruth. But would you pray with me as we start? God, we do thank you. We thank you for all of the things you give us and have given us and will continue to give us. Thank you that you not only give us the tools of resiliency in our lives, but that your promise to us is that you will be our protector. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I was thinking about this. All of the people that I know who have ever been named Ruth have been completely strong and resilient people. And if your name is Ruth, I want you to log on and put a heart on the screen. Or perhaps you know of a Ruth. But just think about the, the number of powerful Ruth people there have ever been. Of course, there is the notorious RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. The figure in cultural anthropology which comes to mind, a woman by the name of Ruth Benedict, who literally went into parts of the world where there were headhunters and she studied them. And then, of course, probably the most powerful women's basketball athlete in ever is Ruthie Bolton, who played and played for Sacramento, came from Mississippi area, and she has bigger biceps than I have legs. And then, of course, those of a generation remember a certain Dr. Ruth Westheimer. Need I say more? But my favorite Ruth in my life was my grandma, Ruth Ellen Baird. Ruth was born in, in 1919, and this is Ruth in Merced, California, where she was raised riding, a trick riding, it must be said, her favorite pony. But my grandma was so strong, so resilient, so full of moxie and, and chutzpah. She raised five kids. She would get them into the bath and out of the bath and into bed and make meals for them. She taught them how to ride horses. She was married to a workaholic Presbyterian pastor. And honestly, I don't know, I've never met anybody like that before. She graduated from Cal Berkeley at a time when most women did not go to college, the first of a group. But the time in my grandma Ruth's life that I saw her being the most resilient was towards the end of her life. It happened on a Sunday afternoon at about 11 o'clock in Los Angeles, California. And there she and her late husband, James, my grandpa, were leaving the Emanuel Presbyterian Church parking lot to go home to Pasadena. Now, those of you who may be watching from LA know that all of the roads and streets in LA area have the in front of them. So it's the 101, the 210, the 118, the five. So all grandpa had to do was get on the five to get to Pasadena. But Grandpa was beginning to lose it in his life. He was beginning to slow down early signs of Alzheimer's, which would eventually claim his life 10 years later. So Grandpa gets on the five, but going south. Grandma gently reminds him that, that he needs to go I-5 north, or the five. And he says something like this, and he never lost his temper to anybody, but he said, I am driving this car. And then he said something like, just be a passenger. Just be a passenger. 
And so, that's what my Grandma Ruth did. She was just a passenger, heading south through LA, through Riverside, and she was just a passenger. She decided to be a passenger as they continued through, through Palm Springs. She decided to be a passenger as they're heading towards Blythe on the border of Arizona and California. She said to herself, I'm just gonna be a passenger. And it must be said that she decided to be a passenger for my grandpa for the next 10 years as he continued to devolve in his own motor skills and his own abilities. But that leads us to our first and, and main and most important point today. One of the keys to being a resilient person is, and would you say it with me, to just be a passenger. So what does that mean? It means that when you're a passenger, you may not understand what you're going through, but that you are just gonna be a passenger and see where the road leads. It means that you may not like what's happening to you right now, but that you're just gonna be a passenger and go along with it. It means that you may not know what the future holds, but that you're just gonna help me out, be a passenger and see what's around the next bend. In terms of a, a Christian perspective, being a passenger in this life means that you know and I know that we are not in charge of our lives, that God is, and that God knows what's best. Being a pastor means pass, a passenger means that life is full of mountaintop experiences, but it is also full of valleys, of shadows, of death. And being a passenger means that there are things and people and situations in life that intend to harm us, but that God is going to still use them for good. Now, one last point before we move to Ruth. Being a passenger does not mean that you have to be passive. Being passive says that you are going to let go and not really believe that there is a better future. And it must be said that there are times in our lives when there are abusive factors when we should absolutely not be passive. Being a passenger means that you have a destination and know that the future is going to be good. So let's take a look at Ruth from the Old Testament. Now Ruth comes from a Moabite culture and Moabite women and girls had absolutely no rights, absolutely no human dignity or people treated them with any sense of decency. Even worse than the Jewish homes, the Moabite culture treated women very poorly. And that is how Ruth begins her life. The place that, that Ruth lived, Moab, was literally the geographic context of famine after famine after famine. Perhaps you remember the character of, of Lot from the Bible or, or Esau. Both of these characters move their people to the land of Moab, and as soon as they do, there is famine. So if you are a Moabite woman, the only place that you might advance in your life is by marrying as well as you can. And so that's what Ruth incredibly and miraculously does. She marries this socialite family from Jerusalem or from, from Bethlehem who have come down and have lived in Moab, and she marries a man named Malon, and they have a good life, but then he dies. And so she is totally lost, and yet if you are a Moabite woman, you could at least rely on your family or your married family to care for you. And that's where her father-in-law, Elimelech, dies, and her brother-in-law, Kilion, dies. And so there Ruth is, lost and alone, and that's where she decides to be a passenger. So let's take a look at our text. It comes to us from the Bible, which you're welcome to open your own Bible or the text is on the screen. Listen for God's word. It comes to us from Ruth 1, 15 through 18. So Naomi is basically trying to ditch Ruth. And so she says to, to Ruth, look, your sister-in-law is going back to her people. By the way, if you hear a little bit of racial elitism here, perhaps even the R word racism here, you will be correct. 
Anytime you ever hear somebody refer to somebody else as you and your people, not good. Going back to her people and her gods, go back with her. Literally, Naomi is saying here, go away. Nice, Naomi, nice. But then is where we hear the beautiful phrase about being a passenger. And this is where Ruth says, don't urge me to leave you or to turn my back from you. Now, in the ancient world, as in today, if you ever turn your back on somebody, it's just rude. If I was to deliver my sermon with my back to you, you would have right to feel insulted. And so Ruth is saying, I want to respect you. And then she says, where you go, I will go. Now, again, those of you who have been in the faith a while have heard this so many times, it is going to be hard for you to hear it with fresh ears. But just listen. What, what Ruth is really saying to Naomi is, wherever you decide to live the rest of your life, I'm going to go there. If you decide to go to Egypt, I'll live in Egypt. If you decide to live in the Saudi Arabian desert, I hate snakes and scorpions, but I will go there. If you decide to live in a boat out on the ocean, I don't like water, but I will go there. She says, I will go where you go. Then she says an even more powerful thing, where you stay, I will stay. Have you ever noticed that staying in life is so much harder than going? That's the hardest thing about this COVID moment for I think all of us. If we were told by the CDC and the World Health Organization that what we have to do over the next year is just like keep moving, going outside, going on trips around the world, I think most of us would be like, cool. It's just being told and having to stay in one place that is so hard. And then she says this, your people will be my people. Now, remember that that Ruth is a cultural immigrant. She is coming from what we might call today a third world country that is totally impoverished. And yet she is giving that life up to go to Bethlehem. And you might say, well, that's a better life for for Ruth. But but I just want to say this about immigration. We need as many immigrants in this country who want to become naturalized citizens as we can. That is what makes America great. And I just have to say, if you've ever been to a naturalization ceremony, and I have because my own mother went to one, I went to her naturalization ceremony. When a person gives up their former country of origin and moves to the United States, don't assume that they aren't giving up a whole lot just because they're coming from sometimes a poorer country. Your people will be my people. And then Ruth says this, your God will be my God. Now, I don't want to turn this into a theology class, but but Ruth's God was a God known as Chemosh. And Chemosh was known as the destroyer God. And the thing about Chemosh is he was a mean God, but at least you knew where he stood on any given occasion. Naomi's God, Yahweh, the God we worship, Yahweh is tougher to pin down. Yahweh is real, but Yahweh is ethereal. And Yahweh is, Yahweh is sometimes more ambiguous. Yahweh is the wind that blows. And so Ruth is giving up her concrete Chemosh God to move towards a moving, ethereal, ambiguous God named Yahweh. And then she says this, where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me ever so severely if even death separates you and me. Knowing what we do about Chemosh being a God that deals severely, you you see that Ruth is still in the Chemosh mindset as she moves to Yahwehism. So that's what happens. When Naomi realizes that Ruth was determined, what a great word for resiliency, to go with her, she stopped urging her. In other words, she stopped trying to ditch Ruth. But that is where Ruth becomes a passenger. See, she decides to make Naomi 
the leader, and she's a passenger with her. And she follows Naomi, who, who, by the way, changes her name to Mara, which literally means bitter. She changes her name as she's complaining all the way to Bethlehem. She becomes a passenger when she gets there in a field, not as like a first-class field hand, but as the lowest-class field hand as she goes out into the fields and she picks up little bits of grain, gleans. She becomes a passenger when she marries an older man who probably isn't the most exciting person, but, but he's nice, stable. And she becomes a passenger when she has a son named Obed, who, by the way, would be the great, 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 great grandpa of Joseph, the earthly father of Jesus. But I just want to say a word to you today, especially to parents. Now, I've talked to a lot of you parents today and this last week on Wednesday and Thursday, and it's been wonderful to hear your stories. But a few of you have told me that you think that your kids are sort of just doing their own thing and that you are just just having a hard time like keeping them together. And in today's language, what I might say is that you feel like your kids are in the driver's seat and you are a passenger. And what I want you to hear is you're right. Your kids are in the driver's seat of their life. And you are just a passenger. We might say a navigating passenger, but you're just a passenger. And they have to drive the cars of their life and make good decisions and bad decisions and have the consequences of those. And I've heard many of you parents say to me with tears in your eyes this last week, I just feel like I'm a really bad parent. And what I want you to hear is you are not a bad parent. You are a great parent. You are doing a great, great job. This is just a really tough time. And your kids are totally cray cray, okay? All right, let's get back to the text. So again, you would think that, that Ruth's life would completely fall apart the moment she became a passenger in her life, right? Because that's the, that's the American way. Individuality, freedom, human rights, self-assertion, paddle your own canoe, be in charge of your life. Actually, Ruth's life takes off the moment she becomes a passenger to someone else. It's that moment that she begins to thrive. All the bad things happen to her before she becomes a passenger. So two, two points before we close today. The first is I want to encourage you to be a passenger in somebody else's life. And what I mean by passenger is I want you to be a friend. That's what, by the way, Ruth means in Hebrew. It means friend. And so I want you to be a passenger. Maybe that is your spouse, your husband or your wife. What if, what if you thought of your husband or your wife or your partner or your spouse is not, is not a bill payer and a lover, but what if you saw them as a friend? Maybe it's somebody who lives next to you. Maybe it's somebody that you work with. Maybe it's somebody of a different faith system somebody who comes from a Hindu background or a Muslim background or a Jewish background or don't even believe in God at all. I just want you to encourage you to be a passenger with that person, to be a friend. And I must say, as we are in transition in our youth program, this may be an opportunity for you to be a passenger, to be a friend to one of our next-gen students who so badly needs one. Now, I just wanna say something here. Don't be a mentor to these kids. They don't need mentors. They need friends. They don't need advice unless they're asking for it. They just need a friend. Interestingly, I just gave you advice not to give advice, so I'm not even taking my own advice. Okay. Notice, Ruth does not ever give Naomi one bit of advice. Not one. She doesn't say, you know, Ruth, I mean, Naomi, you got to get your life together. You, you've got a bad attitude. She, she doesn't say to Naomi, Naomi, I, I'm not sure that Bethlehem's the right place to go. Why don't we head to Alexandria instead? No, she, she just is a passenger and therefore changes Naomi's life. The last point is this. I want to encourage you to be a passenger with God. 
And I'm gonna try right now to, uh, to not employ one of the most annoying contemporary Christian songs called Jesus Take the Wheel. Carrie Underwood, I, I love you, I love everything you do, that just isn't your best piece of work. So I, I don't wanna talk about Jesus driving the car. I, I wanna tap into a much deeper and richer tradition that goes back thousands of years. It's called Coram Deo. Coram Deo, say it with me. In Latin, it means God is in charge. It means that we humans need to wait on God and let God do what God wants to do and we will be a passenger with God. I'll close with this. One of my favorite preachers and a, and a real friend is, is John Ortberg. And John, if you're watching, I want you to know we love you here at Burl Press and we are, we are pulling for you. But John preached a sermon many years ago called Waiting for God in which he talked about these famous, famous trapeze artists knowing as the, known as the flying rudellas. And in that sermon, he said this, there is a special relationship between the flyer and the catcher on the trapeze. The flyer is the one who lets go. The catcher is the one who catches. The flyer swings high above the crowd on the trapeze. The moment comes when he or she must let go. And the catcher is the one who catches. And the flyer swings high above the crowd on the trapeze and the moment comes when he or she must let go. And he or she arcs out into the air. And their job is to remain as still as possible and wait for the strong hands of the catcher to pluck them out of the air. Now here's the kicker. The flyer must never try to catch the catcher, but must wait in absolute trust. The catcher will catch them, but they must wait. As Ruth found herself flying through the air all alone, Wondering whether anyone would catch her. It must have been so scary. And maybe that's the way you feel today. Maybe you feel like you are flying through the universe and you are wondering if anyone will catch you. Be assured that God will. That we just have to wait and be caught by the catcher to be a passenger. Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you for being the catcher of our lives. We want to be more like Ruth. We want more of her resiliency. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Graham, for that message on Ruth and her resilience. We recognize that through all of the bumpy parts in our own lives, God continues to give us blessings. They may come disguised, but ultimately they become clear to us. So in gratitude for what God has done in our lives, is doing in our lives, and has yet to do, let us now give our offerings to God.
As we come to our time of prayer this morning, I invite you to close your eyes and take a deep breath. God, we thank you for the example of Ruth. We hold her up as an example of faithfulness to another human despite her own personal tragedy. Her life with Naomi began in famine and death, and with her willingness and your blessing, it ended in fullness and companionship. In remembering Ruth, we might be prone to skip over the unpleasant truths in her life. She was an outsider, a woman, the daughter-in-law of Naomi who became a widow and tried to send Ruth away. Ruth was a widow herself, separated from her family of origin. And yet Ruth became inextricably woven into your story, God. She became part of the lineage of David and ancestor to Jesus. And so she is inextricably woven into our story. She was also the namesake for my own mother. Today we pray that you will turn your eye to all who are experiencing famine, from a dull ache in the belly and a famine of spirit. Feed us with food to nourish our bodies and our spirit. We pray for those who feel abandoned. Bring friendships and companionship that reflect your loyalty and commitment to us. We pray for everyone whose experience today is one of an outsider. We are all your people, no matter where we were born, where we live, and who our family members might be. So gather us into your family as brothers and sisters. We pray for all who feel powerless. Like Ruth, let our care for others build up rather than separate and create beauty through relationships which lead to flourishing lives for all. Hope and resilience go hand in hand and enable us to walk through the unexpected without surrendering to despair. We know that we can walk through these troubled times and you can use them to generate life just as you did for Ruth. Where you go, I go. We long to say these words to you, God. Where you go, we will go. Where you lead, we will follow. And if for some reason we are not able to form those words on our lips today, let us rest in the assurance that wherever we go, you go. And now hear our prayer that you taught your disciples to pray and continue to teach us today. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
We hope you enjoyed our worship service today. We always enjoy worshiping with you. Put this on your calendars. February 17th, just a couple weeks from now, is Ash Wednesday. And we will be hosting a live Zoom worship service right from this chapel. You won't want to miss it. It will be at 7 p.m. But until we see you again, God bless you. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you and the peace of God go with you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you.